weddings made in heaven, marriages blessed by the gods. Since time immemorial, men and women have looked for that one true love that lasts for eternity. Up in these mountains in northeastern India, it is no different. Three major tribal communities, the Garos, Kasis and Jahintias, inhabit this hilly strip of land called Meghalaya, which literally means the abode of clouds. In most Asian societies, the male child is often the pride and joy in the family, but not here in the Meghalaya population. Daughters are more favoured. Nowhere is this appreciation of the women folk and their capabilities more evident than at this market. These are Kasi's women. They belong to the same racial stock of Austro-Asian origin from the Far East. As a group, they call themselves the Hai Niu Trap, which means seven huts or families of seven sisters. They believe that they are the descendants of seven heavenly beings who had visited Earth regularly through a ladder. However, one day they got stranded and had remained on this land since. It is apparent in the Kasi society that women are the chief players at home and in business. At this market at Sohra, the capital city of the Kasi kingdom, practically every shop owner is a woman in charge of all major business transactions. Being a girl in these tribes comes with privileges and an honor unimaginable to their urban peers. Prostitution, trafficking and other crimes against women and the female child are not prevalent in these hills. Some statistics have shown that the crime rate is lowest in the Meghalaya region compared to the rest of India. The youngest daughter has the right to have the property which belongs to the to her mother. The kind of land and property that belongs to a Kasi's woman is very substantial. It includes vast tracts of fertile land, fruit orchards, shops, businesses, factories, coal mines, stone quarries and animal farms. Even among those who are not well off, like Waltina C. Yemle, whatever property she has will be given to the youngest daughter, called the Kadu. In Casino, the Kadu, because it's the last in the family, then uh, they can look a uh, father, mother, uh, at, the, at the age they are. You think you are lucky because you are a Kadu? Yes. The ultimate expression of the supremacy of the female is this lady. She is the most important person in the community because she is its chief priestess. Bhatri TCM is the chief matrilineal symbol of the Kazir, the most powerful shaman in northeast India. She administers the clan property and is known to her subjects as the CM Sa'at or the Queen Mother. If not for the fact that the camera crew had staked out at the palace door, it would have been nigh impossible to get a one-on-one -on -one audience with the Queen Mother. 
Batriti inherited her position from her mother, and she is now teaching the ropes to her eldest daughter, who will become the next CM Sa'at upon her mother's death. Nobody has ex ever experienced this except my predecessors, and it's really, what do you say, I don't know, it's really difficult. And because I'm conscious of the responsibility I have to take. There is no overt discrimination against boys who receive the same education as the girls. Among the girls, favoring the youngest is not seen as unfair treatment, but just tradition. According to tradition, yes, she is uh, the most important, but all the children have the, the same, uh, the, the parents treat them alike. Not too far away from the Kasi's tribe is the Jahintias, who also come from the same racial stock. They are among some of the better off tribes because of the rich mineral land they own. Most of them have mines and agricultural land. Due to their unique inheritance system, their wealth remains intact. The sole rights also remain with the youngest or the most favored daughter in the family. There is no sibling jealousy as the whole family respects the tradition. The Jahintias are also matrilineal, but unlike the Garos and Kasis, the line of power is distinctly carried on from mother to son. The Jahintia man has a lot more authority and influence than the Kasi man, because two households depend on him, one as a son, the other as a husband. As care home belongs to a traditional alma of priests, he carries a rod and a rope which are sacred tools to ward off evil. On top of taking care of his family members, he also performs religious duties for the community. For care home, he has been successfully playing the dual role of being the head of two households ever since he was young. Traditionally, the Jahintia husbands practice a well-known custom, the night visitation marriage. In other words, he only gets to see his wife and children at night because he stays with his mother to take care of his sisters and their children. The journey from his mother's house to his wife's takes about 15 minutes. This unique custom stems from their beliefs that the woman has sacrificed enough, especially at childbirth. The ultimate compensation for her is to give her total respect. Jahintia men, like care home, would prefer to be cremated at their mother's homes. As much as his mother is being revered, his wife will be similarly treated by his own sons. While Kehom's family ties with his own children and wife are intact, they are still not as strong as that between him and his mother. The letter H in his name represents his mother's name. Within such family dynamics, conflicts between the wife and mother-in-law are almost expected, but not among the Jahintias. Kehom has seven children, aged four to 12 years. He only gets to see them at night for a couple of hours before they go to bed. He doesn't have too much time to be involved in their education, but he is not too worried, because his brother-in-law, their uncle, performs that function for him. He, in turn, becomes the father figure for his nephews and nieces. An unusual practice that evolves because of the important role accorded to the mother. The Garos are the second largest group in the Meghalaya region. The Garos see Earth as a female entity, and that is why they are a matrilineal society, where property and land is passed through from mothers to daughters. The Garo children still carry the names of their mothers, 
a practice which started in the earlier days, when the women were left to preserve the family name should the men die in battle. Land and property are considered substantial wealth, and this is where the woman for once gets it all, without having to fight for it. It is her inalienable right to be the custodian of these valuable family assets. <laughs> What's unusual about this, though, is that while she is the rightful heir and owner of the land, she does not have any rights in making decisions. Still, Jung Si Sung Ma feels otherwise. She is happy with the powers she has and thinks that women should exercise more powers in her society. Sometimes her husband doesn't like her father's intrusion, but she balances everything carefully. The youngest daughter or any daughter nominated by the mother becomes the next heiress. They call her the Nokma. On top of inheriting property from the maternal side, she also acquires the assets earned by her husband. Her children are treated as assets and she owns them as well. When she dies, her husband has no moral rights to stay in the house. However, this is an old custom which is rarely practiced today. It is not surprising that daughters are the preferred sex because the sons are to leave home after marriage. Marriage is more often one of necessity where the end game is to keep the wealth within the family. Whoever weds the heiress becomes the main trustee of the family wealth. He has to come to his bride's house to live and take care of his in-laws. There is a special name for the man Nokrom. Tuspad Kemomain is one. For the Garos and Kasis, they are still very steep in their cultural dances, which anchor their history distinctively. The age-old conflict between tradition and modernity is still being questioned among the young members. But there are no fixed answers, as they themselves have different views of what their tribe should be like in the future.